on this cup, I'm going to go off of the five indentations that I made while throwing this cup for points for the pattern. And so I'll, I'll measure with my tape here first. And seeing that it is about six and a half centimeters from the rim to that glaze catch, and this top section is a bit wider than the bottom, I'll just go three and a half centimeters up. So that top section from here to here is going to be a bit taller than what you would get from here to here because that form shrinks in a little bit. I want the pattern to actually shrink in as well. All right, so with the pot centered on the wheel, um, if I want to extend that height that I've marked out around to each section, <clears throat> I can just get a stick, or in this case I'm using a ruler, and I hold a pin tool kind of tightly to that and set it at the height that I've already measured. And then I can rotate around and kind of eyeball halfway between those points at the waist of the pot and mark out where I'll be carving to from there. So essentially I'm marking out triangles at this point. The basis for a lot of the patterns that I carve into my work uh, is triangles. And so now it's just a matter of extending this point to the rim. And that I'll just do quickly here. Okay, so now that I have the pattern basically laid out, um, I'll actually move from using the banding wheel at this point to just some of this egg crate foam. And I only really do this for smaller pieces. It's just an easier way to, uh, to get a better angle on carving these. So I mentioned earlier that these patterns are based primarily on triangles. Um, I started with these carving patterns when I was living in Hawaii. And for me, the carving was a way to reference some of the historical patterns that have happened in the, the South Pacific. You know, with tapa fabrics are, are something that you commonly see in Hawaii and um, a lot of really great geometric pattern work on these fabrics. Looking at a lot of that for inspiration when I started and then realized pretty quickly that there are a lot of traditions around the world that have these geometric triangle based pattern traditions. And so I have, have looked at quite a few different ones but have at the same time really tried not to look too closely and have any variations that I come up with come out of experimenting with different patterns as I'm working, you know, thinking about, okay, what would happen if I put this line over here and, you know, moved, moved the layout around a little bit, trying not to be too influenced from, from other traditions. So with this piece, um, this really accentuates what I'm trying to do with these runny glazes on top of the carving because what happens is in the ideal firing get some soda on top of this glaze and it really will run quite a bit and that runny glaze I only put on the top section of the piece over the carving. What happens is it starts to actually get channeled through those those grooves that I've carved and on top of this very kind of tight and precise carved pattern, I start to get a much looser, less controlled layer of pattern that happens in the glaze through kind of loosely controlled dripping really is what's happening. And a lot of times people will see the finished work and ask, you know, okay, so did you actually paint that glaze selectively in those areas? And, and I don't, you know, it's just the top half gets dipped with glaze and all of the movement that is happening with the glazes is, is in the kiln. So I finish this bottom row right down into the crease that I've made when I was throwing this piece, knowing that as that glaze does drip in the kiln and slide down the side of the pot, it'll actually catch on this ridge right here and it'll want to disperse to the side rather than coming straight down especially if there's already a flow of glaze over here. It's kind of, I always imagine it like honey, you know, kind of pulling the rest of the liquid along and it will, it will actually flow down just in those sections if I'm lucky. At this point, I'd say a good firing is probably 
uh, you know, somewhere around 90% of them coming, coming out as I was imagining. But, you know, that seems like the biggest trap as a potter is trying to imagine too specifically how the pieces are going to come out. I know that's a big way that I set myself up for disappointment. <laughs> I'm really careful to take note, whether it's just mental note or actually, um, you know, with, with my phone taking a lot of pictures as I'm unloading a kiln. If I see something that catches my eye that's, uh, you know, I'm thinking, okay, that's different than what I've seen before, I'll snap a picture of it. It's really just a way of taking visual notes, um, but, you know, I can, I can see a result and say, oh, okay, yeah, I want to try maybe changing the form a little bit or the carving pattern to see if I can get that glaze to move a different way. Now I'm putting vertical lines in and a big part of what these kind of are about is creating layers because this carving can really sometimes show up as just this two-dimensional and kind of flat layer. And so the more that I can do with my patterns to, um, to kind of create different layers for depth, um, to me, the more interesting that surface becomes. And so just by having these vertical lines um, as the background, it, it really kind of sets that, that pattern off and really brings it off of the surface. Whereas on its own, this pattern can, pattern can be nice. It, I think, is a lot nicer with the background lines. Okay, so now that I'm finishing up with the background, the last step here is to carve the floor of this pot, the bottom of it. And what I do is I just kind of eyeball from these points around the edge and extend those points up to the bottom here. And I'll just make little tiny pinpoint marks in five points there. And then just finish this flower petal pattern off onto the bottom of the pot. And I'll usually wait a bit because the, um, the bottom of the pot is usually the wettest spot. And so it's often too wet to really get a good carved line if you try to do it at the same time that you carve the top. So I'll just set them aside for a few hours and come back to them. As far as the idea of, you know, putting the extra time and effort into carving the bottom, one of the elements that I, I really enjoy in my work is being able to have that little element of surprise, whether it's a, a decoration on the inside of a lid jar or, you know, turning a piece over and having a decoration. You know, if it's going to be handmade, then I really feel like all of those details should be considered.